I'm Deb Nygaard, your current president, and I'm really glad to see you folks, your um, nice fresh faces here. So would you please join me in the flag pledge? Now, if you haven't muted yourself, go ahead and do that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you very much. Kathy, did we have anybody step forward for an invocation? Yes, Julie oh, Warren. Thank you, Julie. You're welcome. My invocation today focuses on volunteers. The majority of people at the start of a new year make resolutions they may or may not keep. Another thought, which really could be the Rotarian way, is that we make a promise to ourselves to continue the volunteering we do now and be observant of other opportunities that may come our way as the year progresses, maybe even some outside of our comfort zone. Here's the poem I found. Volunteers, it's not for money, it's not for fame, it's not for only personal gain. It's just for love of fellow men. It's just to lend a helping hand. It's just to give a little of self. That's something you can't buy with wealth. It's not for medals worn with pride. It's just for the feeling deep inside. It's that reveal deep in your heart. It's a feeling that you've been a part of helping others far and near. That makes you a volunteer. Volunteers give time today to make life better tomorrow. And with that, let us bow our heads and be thankful we are here today among a group of people who make volunteering home and abroad part of their everyday life. Thank you, Julie, that's beautiful. And um, I'd like us to just take a moment too to remember Don Craighead. Uh, he passed away over the holidays and um, the family held a, a private ceremony, and I think that um, a more public one has yet to be announced. Is that correct, Kathy? Yeah. That's so, correct. Yeah. Um, but feel free to extend your condolences to Sandy. That's, that's a, a significant loss to our club and to Rotary and to the world. So did we have a record reporter for today? Lawrence Thank you, Lauren. Watson. Appreciate that very much. And I'm going to actually turn it over right away to Jenny Heedall to introduce our esteemed speakers today. I'm actually very excited for this. So go ahead, Jenny. Thank you. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Super excited to be here and um, looking forward to in six months. I can't believe it, but I will be oh. in Deb's role too. So just uh, really excited about that. But today we're here to hear from two of our club members who are continually, one of them we've known for a while, but I think we have more to learn and one is returning. So Tom User, we're gonna to start with Tom. He's gonna to give us about 15 minutes, tell us a little bit more about him. And he, I know he's got some slides and a few things that Kathy's gonna help out with. And he has this fabulous shirt on today. Uh, <laughs> and then we'll hear from Ted Johnson as well. So I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. So this is uh, not exactly the way I wanted to put it together, but uh, I, we'll make it work. So I've got a series of pictures I want to share. Um, 15 minutes, you know, that's, uh, that's a real challenge for a past district governor to, uh, to only talk that long, but I'll do my best and uh, jump in when I'm getting too long. So um, I born and raised on a farm out in southwestern Minnesota. This was the farmstead. Uh, just a little bit of how we used to operate some 60, 70 years ago. And uh, for all of you city dwellers, that's what the driveway looked like once in a while this time of the year. So that wasn't a lot of fun to plow out of there. But that's what it was all about is producing those kind of crops. After high school, um, and I, I, a little bit of background real quick. Uh, I was a skinny little kid, so I didn't do much in athletics, but I, uh, I was a student manager for all of the athletics and my art graduating class was 29. So you had to be in everything. And so I was student manager for all the sports and then in band and uh, drama and all of those kinds of things. 
Uh, and I started doing some writing but since I wasn't competing in sports. I started doing some writing about the sporting activities for the local weekly newspaper. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. So after graduation from high school, I went to Mankato for one year. I was gonna be a high school math teacher, uh, but I also got a job in the student newspaper at Mankato State. And uh, I realized that that was really what I wanted to do was to be a journalist. And so then I transferred to the university. <clears throat> Graduated from the university in the summer of 63. And I put this picture up. This is out in the front of Northrop Auditorium. And the reason I use this picture is that I graduated after the first summer session. And uh, so that was, uh, I guess, the end of July. And uh, our ceremony, because it was a relatively small number of, of students, and it was grad students and undergrads and so on, I'm guessing there were maybe 250, 300 of us up there. We had just processed, processed in and uh, Malcolm Moose was president at the time and uh, he stepped up to the podium and about that time a thunderstorm just erupted and it looked like it was not gonna quit. And so, he, as I said, he was at the podium and he said, I he hereby confer degrees on all of you and we scattered to the winds. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a, a, a a commencement message I have to remember, but I do remember the setting. So after I graduated from the U, I went out to the Morris campus, actually. Um, it was in just its second year of operation, and uh, I was their public information officer. Um, you know, you're a new college graduate, and you think you know it all and can do everything, but my, my advisor from the university had said, you know, you really shouldn't take a PR job until you've had some actual media experience. And I said, oh, I think I can do it. So after one year, I realized that he was right and I was wrong. And so then I went north from there and went up to Fergus Falls. And I got a job as the sports editor this, because the staff was just me uh, uh, of the Fergus Falls Journal. And um, so this is a picture from one of the first springs that I was in that job. That was supposed to be the day of the opening of the golf course at Fergus Falls. Needless to say, I had my clubs along, but I really needed the shovel just to get into the into the golf course, and it, and it didn't open. Um, one of the other things that I that I did while I was there, in addition to writing sports, because I had grown up hunting and fishing, so I started writing an outdoor column, and uh, and uh, we picked up this this uh, golden lab, and uh, she loved to be out there with me. So uh, this was a picture that we we put together as I used in, in one of my columns and so on. Um, and that leads me to this picture. I was out hunting one, one fall and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I shot a pair of Canadian geese like these two pictured here. Well, and one of them was banded. So you can see the band down there below the picture or but yeah, below the, the and that, this is actually a, a picture of the print of the duck stamp that year that was being sold. So anyway, I had so I sent the the stamp or the uh, the numbers off of the off of the band into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then the card at the bottom uh, was the answer I got back. Although it was I think maybe almost a year later. By that time, I had because I did shoot two Canadian geese, and one of them was banded, and. The, the, the goose standing to the left on shore, you sort of can see that on its right leg, it has a band. So it just all kind of came together. Well, as it turns out, that goose was part of a flock that wintered in northern Mississippi and spent the summertime in Hudson Bay. And he had been banded 10 years before I shot him. So he had 10 round trips between Hudson Bay and Mississippi. Had I known that, I probably wouldn't have cleaned him and tried to eat him because he was kind of tough. But uh, uh, but I, I put all those pieces together just because it worked right. And then when we were, we've been out in California, I think most of you know now for the past 19 years and looking at that one day and said, you know, this doesn't belong in, in California. So one summer when we came back, I brought it back and I went up to Fergus Falls and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a uh, an educational unit up there. And one of the things they talk about is banding ducks and geese and other birds. And so I, I gave it to them and they were very pleased to have a, 
a kind of a real life example that they could share with the young people that come out to, to learn more about banding and so on. So after five years in Fergus Falls, I went down to Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. We were there for three years, but Luther, if, if you know, is just south of, of Rochester up in the northeast corner of Iowa. So we, we still went and bought a, a Minneapolis newspaper. We listened to WCCO radio and both Liz's parents and mine were, were living in Minnesota and we were back every weekend we could get away. So we kind of looked at each other after three years and said, you know, we really want to be back in Minnesota, don't we? And, uh, and so I was fortunate enough to find a job in Wasika with the University of Minnesota branch that there was just in its second year of operation. This was part of our, of our administrative group. Uh, the, the gentleman that's standing uh, to, my, to my left is Ed Frederick, that I think many of you will know as a former past district governor in this district. And uh, uh, the second, the first one to my right and the one to Ed's left, uh, Tom Fighter and Tom Lindahl and, and me as Tom User. So if Ed wanted something done, he just said, Tom, you take care of it. And then it was up to us to figure out who he meant. So this is my, my what, my, my picture in posterity. You all know, all probably recognize Hubert Humphrey. Well, that extra set of hands that's helping adjust his his cap on his cap and gown are my arms. I'm directly behind him, but nobody could see anything but my kind of my hands right there. So that was kind of fun. Um, <clears throat> after the Wasika campus closed in in 70 in 92, um, and again, I think many of you will know uh, kind of a sad commentary, I think, on our society today when the university closes a an institution of higher education and sells it to the federal prison system, where it's now a, a, a prison, prison for women at the, international, or the national level, excuse me. This was part of our group. When I joined the staff there, they were just getting ready to start a capital campaign. And uh, after some consulting with, with the experts and so on, the decision was that they would, uh, uh, excuse me, the decision was that they they were going to raise a billion dollars, and uh, they uh, excuse me. Um, so I they put me on the road because one third of our alumni were living in other parts of the country, and uh, they said, "Tom, go out and see if those people that uh, we've been ignoring for twenty years uh, would be interested in making a gift." which is what I did. And uh, it turns out that, that it was going to work out OK. And so I'll share with you one story that I was able, or a gift that I was able to close. A, uh, a donor said to me one day, this gentleman had graduated right after the Depression. And this was three or four years after the Depression. And he was, he was a radio announcer. and. Uh, he was visiting with his father one day and his father said, I just talked to your uncle Chet and uh, he had called his brothers and sisters to see if any of them had a thousand dollars they wanted to invest in a new product. Well, it turns out that uncle Chet was the founder of Xerox Corporation. Donald also had a thousand dollars. He put it in and uh, the university now has two endowed faculty chairs and two endowed scholarships because of that thousand dollar investment many, many, many years ago. Uh, in the 2001, uh, I took an early retirement from the university, moved to, to California, and uh, this is the home that we left behind now just uh, a few months ago. Uh, we converted, got rid of grass and trees and put in a desert kind of a landscape instead. Um, all along the way here, and uh, uh, Rotary has been a part of my life, and uh, some of that happened during that time I was with member of the Roseville Club. But in 1976, I joined Rotary in 74. In 1976, the fall of 76, I was selected to lead the GSE team to India. And uh, this gentleman, this family here were, were my very first host families. And that was just a neat experience that, and, uh, 
this was some of the kinds of things we got to see. Another quick story. I was with my host one day, and it probably is this gentleman down here in the front in the, in the yellow. Um, we were going from stand to stand, and he was buying some fruit. And, uh, you know, he would, he would negotiate a price with the, with the, the person in, in the booth, and, uh, but didn't make any purchases. And then he, he said, uh, Tom, would you go back and wait at the car? And I did, and then uh, took this picture as he was there. And I noticed then that he was able to, to close a deal, if you will. And uh, when he came back to the car, I said, what was happening? And he said, when they saw me as an English person, figured there was more money there and they wouldn't come down in price as much as he thought they should. This was another family that I stayed with and the two uh, younger ladies on, on either end are the daughters of this couple. Both couples were, were surgeons in India. And uh, one night over dinner, he talked to me about how he had arranged marriages for, for his two daughters. Um, this was a visit to a site where uh, uh, a micro lending project had provided money to this couple so that they could buy this crushing machine for uh, crushing uh, cane sugar and uh, a, a rotary project. We got to visit the Taj Mahal. My members of my team, as it turns out, were the, the four gentlemen walking down the right side of the, of the waterway and uh, a neat experience, obviously. Um, so I was governor in 70, or, yeah, 76, 77 and uh, 1976, 77, 96, 97, excuse me. And uh, we didn't know much about, I, I'd only been in Rotary two years and we didn't know much about grants and all of that. So when I was district governor, I made arrangements to do a GSE to that same district in India that I had been at. And this is in the center there, Don Salyards in the light blue shirt was the team leader. And I asked Don and all of his team members to come back with a matching grant. And they all did. Don connected with a club and really connected closely. And that ended up to be a 3H grant at the time that, and in that, in that time, that was really the equivalent of what we now call global grants. And so in 70, no, in 2001, I went back to India with Don and these other folks here who were all Rotarians in the district and uh, to visit that dam, which is, which is what was built with that 3H grant. And that's the dam. And so what, what happened now is that this was saving water from the winter monsoons to provide water to a, what, what they still would call a village of almost a million people. Again, this was the members of the, of the uh, the group that visited back there in 2001. One of the things that I did when I went back in 2001 was take along two checks from District 5960 that were from our, somebody's got to help me, uh, Fast for Hope money that year. And I think we had something like $3,000 to distribute. And I had two $1,500 checks that I delivered to two different clubs in India. This was one of the one of them and this was the second one. And that money in one case helped to rebuild a school that was damaged by an earthquake. And that this was the new lab that was built with, with some of that kind of money. And uh, this is a plaque that was put up there. And as you'll see kind of down towards the back, uh, Rotary District 5960, Minnesota, USA and the Rotary Club of Surin Doniger. Uh, that did the remodeling on that on that school. On that same trip, I went to the Rotary Club of Vapi. That's a, a club that I had visited when I was there as a GSE team leader. Well, on this particular evening, um, I'm, I'm invited to sit with a member of that club who's sitting to my right by the name of Kalyan Banerjee. And this was the night that that club nominated him to be international president. And about five years later, Kalyan, in fact, did become the international president for Rotary International. And so I've had a chance to interact with him a few times. And uh, I 
dump this one in here. Um, again, Ed Frederick in the middle that many of you will recognize and, and a few old timers will also recognize Gene Dreesen down in the forefront. Um, both of them from the Wasika Club who were past district governors and as a former uh, member of the Wasika Club, they kind of considered me a part of their triumvirate of PDGs in that club. Um, during some of my rotary years, I've stayed involved with the GSD program. This young lady was somebody that we hosted when we were living out in California, who was a member of a GSE team. And then several years later, as we've done some traveling in Europe, we were able to visit her and her family in Budapest. And when we were in Wasika, we hosted a, a Kali, Kali here, who was a youth exchange student. And so we got to see Kali again on another trip in, in Europe a couple of years ago. Um, Mrs. Deb, can you wrap of, up in five minutes? I will. Okay. I always make a point when I came back to Minnesota in the summertime of trying to get to a club where the PDG was making his visit. And so I, I, caught, uh, I caught Joe at, at his visit. I think we were out in Anoka. Joe was a member of my GSE team. And uh, so that was uh, kind of fun to see him stay in Rotary and become a, a past district governor. I was invited to be the president's representative to a Rotary Club meeting in uh, Wisconsin. Um, we were at the International Convention two years ago, met this young couple who are from that same district in India where we, uh, where we, where I went as a GSE team leader. Just a couple other quick things. I had a chance to go back to a small town in Southern Czech Republic where my great great grandparents uh, emigrated from, and this was the the farmstead where they where they lived at the time they immigrated. Uh, made made up Rotary several places around the world. This was in Vienna, Austria, two summers ago, and the Rotarian uh, on the on the left side of the picture had never been to a, a makeup in his life. But I talked him into going with me. He was also on the river cruise that we were with. This was a, a club a flag exchange in, in Hawaii. Uh, this, this, this is a picture in Berlin that's kind of a Holocaust memorial. And this was the picture uh, when Reagan had told Gorbachev to tear down the wall. Uh, we got to see the, uh, the doors in Wittenberg where Luther uh, put the theses uh, on the 500th anniversary. And I will quit. Thank you, Tom. It's so good to get to know you. And we're really glad that you've come back to the club. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's Ted's turn now. Okay. All right, I'm ready to start, I guess, right? You have the um, pictures for me, Kathy, I assume. Um, so I will start out, uh, there we go. Um, go back to that first one, there we go. Um, I was uh, born in St. Paul, as they say, at an early age, um, actually at, at the Midway Hospital. My parents had been uh, teachers in Aiken and um, they met there. Uh, I was born in St. Paul and then they went back and taught there. So I don't remember Aiken much, but I think I was there for about three years. Um, and, um, but I grew up primarily in North St. Anthony Park in my younger years because my father quit teaching. This is my mother and um, my um, siblings, uh, I think out in the backyard uh, where we lived in St. Paul, uh, just two blocks from the St. Paul campus my dad took a job with the YMCA, and the Y has had a major influence on our lives ever since. I learned to swim, for example, there at the, um, at the pool at the St. Paul campus. He was the executive for that, um, or assigned there as the person to run the Y there. Um, and um, it was an uh, interesting um, experience there. Um, but um, my, I was involved with the Y as a kid, uh, he later became the director of the Midway Y when it was in an old house uh, on Pryor Avenue. Um, 
and um, we we lived uh, in the Twin Cities until um, my eighth grade, and we then moved to Winona, where my dad uh, took the job as the Winona uh, Y director. Um, we were active in a church in St. Paul, and I started as a kid singing in in choirs there as a uh, as a young person in the kids' choir, and I've been singing in choirs or choruses uh, ever since. Um, my first experience in Rotary was actually in Winona when I was in high school. Um, they had a program for what they call junior Rotarians. And um, the uh, idea was they, of course, back then it was all, all men. So they would uh, name two uh, senior boys each month to become a, um, a rot Rotary junior rot Rotarian and come to the meetings for uh, meals, which we loved to do. When, when I got that month, we were out of, out of lunch for four weeks um, and had a great time. And I remember one of my experiences living there as a high schooler in Winona um, was to work for, uh, as a volunteer to stand, to go to uh, downtown Winona on the top of the tallest building at night and uh, report on airplanes flying over, watching for enemy aircraft uh, that might be um, uh, flying over. and. Um, why they were worried about enemy aircraft in the middle of the country at that point, I'm not sure. But um, one of the other things that I learned uh, through the Y, my, uh, my parents were uh, involved in some of the international Y uh, business. And so occasionally we'd have visitors uh, who were Y staff coming from abroad. And they had a program back then, which the University of Minnesota ran with its y, uh, YM called the, um, the International Weekend. Uh, and in Winona, we hosted a group of, internet, of uh, university students for a weekend uh, there. And I found that was an interesting um, idea and a program. When I was young, my dad and I would always be um, putting the uh, storm windows on in the wintertime, in the fall, uh, taking down the screens, and we'd, stand, we'd be outside listening to the Minnesota Gophers football. So I never had any idea of going to any other school except the university. Uh, which is what I did after I graduated from Winona. Um, and um, uh, we, um, my first year I lived with my grandparents also in North St. Anthony Park. Uh, and then in my sophomore year, I uh, lived at the dorm that the Y had on 4th and 15th um, in um, Minneapolis. Um, one of my roommates uh, one time was a Japanese student, was another uh, international connection. And I got interested because I knew about the international weekends. I actually went uh, as an American student. They usually had a couple of um, Minnesota students go with those uh, weekends. I went to uh, Redwood Falls and another location um, for those weekends as well. Um, and uh, uh, my plans when I went to university were to become an electrical engineer like my grandfather. But after two years of that, I was tired of it, um, not happy with it, and decided I would move into liberal arts. And uh, I had taken um, all requirements for two years except for one class, which was political science. So I decided I already had one class for political science. Why don't I major in it, not knowing what it was about particularly. Uh, but that's what I started doing. Um, and I also joined the ROTC. Um, another program that the Y ran uh, back then was called Students in Industry Seminars in the Summertime, where they brought in students from all over the uh, Mid Midwestern universities to the, um, the Y uh, dormitory. Uh, and uh, we would spend, I think it was six weeks um, there uh, talking about industry seminars, uh, touring around the Twin Cities and getting to know people from other, um, other colleges and cities around the area. And that's where I met my wife. Um, she came into the um, dorms, I remember, with some of my buddies uh, standing in the hallway and watching the women walk in downstairs and the guys were kind of picking out which ones they liked. And this one woman, uh, a gal walked in there and I, for some reason, the thought came into my head that maybe um, um, she would be a nice wife. And that's actually how, who, I actually, who I married. Um, 
my best friend at the Y at the time started dating her. So I was with somebody else. Uh, eventually that changed and she and I started dating and we got um, dated for the next year and got um, got married um, a, a year later, just before starting our junior year, um, much to the disgust of um, our parents. But anyway, uh, we, we lasted um, for a, a long period. We were actually married for 115 years, as I say, uh, because uh, she was married for 57 and a half and I was also, and that adds up to 115 years, right? Um, and then, um, so after uh, we got married, um, she moved from Fargo where she'd been going to school um, and took her senior year at the St. Paul campus, uh, graduating in, uh, in home economics. Um, I was continuing my studies in becoming international relations oriented. And um, my um, advisor at the time um, was discussing with me my program. I was trying to figure out if I could graduate within four years. And he said, well, you don't have a very strong um, list of courses here yet for a major. And he said, you're international relations and you don't have any kind of language. And I would recommend you think about doing an extra year of university and also taking a couple of years of language. But he said, don't study Spanish or French or the ordinary ones, take something different like <clears throat> Russian or Japanese or something like that. And I said, well, uh, um, do they, do they teach some of those here? He says, of course they do, go across the campus uh, and uh, there's a language building there and you can go in there and talk to some professors and see what you might be interested in. So I went over the building and I saw that the uh, Russian and Chinese and Japanese and things like that were on the top floor. So I took the elevator and um, looked down one hall, looked down the other, there was a light down one hall. So I walked to the end of it um, most of the rooms were, uh, doors were closed. The light was on in um, the Chinese room. So I walked in, there was a secretary sitting there and she said, may I help you? And I said, well, I'm here to inquire about studying uh, language. And, uh, and um, as soon as I said that, uh, this guy pops out of the door next door there and says, oh, you're interested in Chinese, come in, come in. And so I ended up taking two years of Chinese um, and so when I graduated, I ended up with an international relations major, military science because of ROTC and a minor in Chinese. Um, uh, and so I graduated as a, um, as a second lieutenant and needed to go into the army. Um, my wife had graduated the year before. And so for our fifth year, my fifth year in college, uh, she'd gotten a job as a home, uh, uh, home agent in Waconia. Um, and we had moved there. Uh, so I commuted in from Waconia um, and I had gotten a job at the university uh, earlier than that. So while uh, I was taking my senior year, I was also working at nights at the University of Minnesota Hospital in the medical records department. Um, and uh, which was um, kind of an interesting background based on what happened to me later, but um, um, so I went to, uh, the orders came in for us to go to, um, to training. I was to have two years in the military and six years reserve. Uh, I was assigned to in military intelligence. So I was to go to Fort Benning for basic training for four months and then Fort Hollibird for four months. Um, and this was to start in, in early February, I think it was 1958. And, um, uh, about three months, four months before we went, my orders changed. Uh, the Army set up a new program where the reserve was to be six months instead of two years, and then um, seven and a half years in reserves. And um, so uh, my, my wife, and by that time we had our first child, and I, uh, the three of us went, uh, moved to Fort Benning. Um, the Army had not figured out that Four years at Benning and four years at Hollibur did not quite uh, exactly equal six months. Um, so I never got my specialty training. Instead, they sent me to Fort Leonard Wood in uh, Missouri uh, in a basic training company for two months. And then we came back to the Twin Cities. Um, and that's when I started thinking about going to uh, law school, um, 
or, or um, thinking about accounting as a possible uh, degree. Um, but a best friend of mine decided to um, uh, talk me into, I guess, or talk me about going and checking out the library uh, school. And that's what I did. Um, I have a picture here as, um, uh, as a lay minister because I started doing that um, early in my life as being assisted lay minister. And uh, this is a much later time, as you can see in the photograph um, here in uh, St. Paul after we moved back. Uh, but, I, uh, but I ended up being an assisting minister in uh, churches um, uh, ever when, when I started that, I think it was in 1959 um, and have been until um, about two years ago. Um, so, um, yeah, before the other thing I was going to mention too, I had, before we went to um, Georgia and uh, Fort Benning, um, I needed to work to, to do. So I was a taxi driver in Minneapolis. I'd grown up in St. Paul, so I really knew St. Paul very well, but I did not know much about Minneapolis. Uh, but I certainly learned it in doing it, being a taxi driver. So I'm one of the few Twin Cityans, um, I think, who either knows St. Paul uh, and knows Minneapolis, because most Minneapolitans don't know how to get around St. Paul and vice versa. Um, so my, um, after getting my library degree, I, I studied that for a year, I got a master's degree and I applied for jobs in six locations. Um, of different kinds, and I uh, got acceptances in all six, uh, which was uh, not the case sometimes these days, but it was back then. Um, and so I um, looked at the different possibilities and uh, decided that the most interesting ones were in the federal government. Uh, the NSA and the CIA had both offered me a position. And uh, I talked to them, I was wondering if they wouldn't um, hire me at a next higher level than they wanted to, to get a, a better salary. And um, NSA said no, CIA said yes. So I actually took the CIA job and I became a librarian at CIA. Um, and uh, you're not supposed to tell anybody that because that's a secret. But anyway, uh, we went to, um, uh, lived in Arlington, Virginia for a couple of years and um, <clears throat> After um, uh, two years there, Columbia University contacted me. They had been looking for a, um, a library position uh, at Columbia and had talked to uh, the library school in Minnesota and they'd recommended uh, that they get in touch with me. And uh, so they moved me away from the government. I was not uh, really impressed with work in the federal government the way staff functioned there. Uh, so I was happy to leave that and I, um, we moved to New York City, uh, became the assistant director in the business library at Columbia. Um, we, um, through the help of the library director at uh, Columbia, uh, he got us a temporary apartment in Manhattan for about three weeks while we could look for some place to live. And with um, a little kid and a dog, my happy was my, my uh, wife was not happy walk on the streets uh, uh, from a tall building and uh, having grown up in small towns in Minnesota and so on. So we moved instead to New Jersey um, where I had commutes uh, from uh, for an hour and a half each way uh, while uh, they enjoyed the uh, nice life out in uh, Maywood, New Jersey. We were there for three years uh, and then um, I'd always been, the whole class had been told by our advisors at the library school and, and um, at the university that we should never feel, once we graduated, never feel that we were not um, um, capable uh, already as becoming a director of a library. And so I kept that in mind and noticed that there was an opening at Hamlin University. And so I applied for it and got that position and uh, we moved back to Minnesota. Um, so I was the director at Hamlin. Uh, I was even appointed as a professor there. And I was there when um, Hamlin built the, the Bush Library um, with the um, architectural firm Hamill Green and Abramson. Um, Dick, um, Dick Hamill was our 
primary architect, which was an interesting assignment um, as well. My buddy from library school that had gotten, gotten me into the field had moved on um, to a position in Washington, D.C. at the National Science, Foundation, so, uh, National Science Foundation, and we'd stayed in touch. And he encouraged me to think about doing any kind of um, a grant uh, program and uh, uh, related to library work and uh, that sort of thing. And I said, "Was it? Is that possible with the NSF?" He says, "Of course it is." He put me in touch with some um, um, uh, folks in in the Washington area who uh, worked on research grants for various organizations, and I connected with them, and we came up with a program to. Uh, develop um, a closer relationship between the faculty and the library staff in planning uh, curriculums and using library and information facilities. This was the time that the no latest technology was microfiche uh, and microfilm. Um, and the 3M Corporation had come to Hamlin and um, because of the connections with uh, Bush, the head of uh, 3M had given a major grant to put in um, microfilm systems in our uh, in our library, and so we used that, which gave uh, the historians uh, an opportunity to get to have their students look back at um, records of history uh, from before they were born, but from the time of perhaps their grandparents, and so they could actually uh, interview family members about history, and then also study about it uh, as well. And it, um, uh, the grant was very successful. Uh, it led to a similar one later and when I moved on to uh, Oberlin College. So I was at Hamlin for seven years, um, met a uh, professor from Oberlin who was a graduate from Hamlin that used to come back and visit regularly. And he decided to um, uh, encourage me to uh, apply at Oberlin. And I was successful at uh, being able to get that. Uh, position next. Um, we had, we, my family and I had been interested in, and my wife and I had been interested in doing international travel, but we'd gotten married so soon, had kids so soon, it was not possible for us. Uh, but as uh, in the 1960s, we learned about the American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis. Now I have Swedish backgrounds. I always thought I was uh, two thirds Swedish because my dad's folks were immigrants from Sweden, met in Minneapolis. My mother had a great, had a grandmother from Sweden who married a, a German guy that came over as a three year old. So I figured I was probably two thirds Swedish and a bit German. Um, <clears throat> turned out when I uh, tried ancestry in more recent years, uh, I'm actually only um, about 44% Swedish. And I came up 34% Norwegian, um, which I never learned until after my wife had died, but she would have been quite proud since she was 100% and about 17% German. And then for some strange reason, um, Scottish for 5%. Um, so you never know what your background is. But in 1968, we discovered American Swedish Institute in Minneapolis and they had charter flights to Sweden. Uh, we had met um, when we first got married, uh, a second cousin of mine and his wife had uh, visited Minnesota after three years in the uh, working in the United States to visit relatives. And we met them uh, not long after we were uh, married and stayed in touch with them. And this is a photograph uh, of one of our trips to Sweden. We went um, the first time in 1970 my wife and our oldest son and, uh, and I. We went back in 73, taking all five of our kids. And then uh, when I was at Oberlin College, we had built um, another library down there. I had hired my friend from the National Science Foundation to join my staff. And he took over running of the library. And I talked my uh, provost into giving me a six month sabbatical. And we went to Sweden and lived there for six months. This is a photograph of our celebrating midsummer on an island on the west coast of Sweden with my cousins, the big guy with a white hat um, and his wife, um, 
and in front of them on the ground. Um, I, um, my, um, my wife is there in the picture. Uh, my son is the tall guy over on the, on the side. Uh, and so we're still in touch with Banked. He's about um, eight years older than I am, so he's up there. And we have visited that family many times uh, in the past uh, uh, as well. Um, um, the, that's an, so that's another international connection we've had as well. Um, so let me um, let me talk a little bit more about Oberlin because that's how I got into Rotary. Um, this is an, a, a, this was from our time in in uh, Oberlin. The first time we had an international student. That's a, a student from Chile. Um, that stayed with us for a year uh, from um, uh, with American Friends Service. Um, and um, uh, when I got to Oberlin, I replaced a woman who'd been the library director there for many years. Um, and she said that there was one thing uh, that was important for me to realize because I was not only a college librarian director, but I was director of the public library. Uh, which is very unusual because the college had tried to get uh, Andrew Carnegie to build them a library building in the early part of the century, and he only would build libraries for public libraries. And so the college uh, established a public library with a public library board, and therefore he built the library, which housed both the public and the college libraries. Um, and so when I got there, Eileen said, told me, she said, you know, I'm a woman. Rotary does not allow women in the club. And the most important club in, this, in the town of Oberlin is the Rotary Club. Uh, uh, so you need to join that club as soon as you have an opportunity. But in the meantime, there's a, an organization called the City Club and I'll get you in the City Club. Um, and then you watch for the opportunity, but you have to be invited to Rotary. It's just not a matter of joining. That was in 1971 when I learned that. 1975, 1974, late 74 is when I got that sabbatical to go to Sweden. And I happened to be, I think it was in November, December, standing outside chatting with my neighbor across the street who was the superintendent of schools. And we were talking about heading off to Sweden and some other things. And, and he says, um, say, um, it occurs to me, you're not in Rotary, are you? And I said, no, I'm not. He says, how come? And I said, well, nobody's invited me. And he said, well, consider yourself asked. And so I joined Rotary in January of 1975. One month later, we got on an airplane and the whole family flew to Sweden. And so my first six months in Rotary was in Sweden. I knew no Swedish other than I think I'd learned from my grandparents the words like butter and thank you and things like that. Um, and uh, so I attended, I tried to attend a couple, three uh, meetings in Sweden, but it didn't go very well because they conducted them in Swedish. And I didn't really feel like I was being um, welcomed that much. Um, and so I didn't pay too much attention to it. Um, but we had a, a fantastic time living in Sweden. Um, we did start taking uh, intensive Swedish language when we got there. And within um, uh, four months, uh, I was able to actually conduct some of the interviews from a grant that I had gotten for the, for the sabbatical in, in Swedish. Um, but I just did not uh, get involved with Rotary at all. Um, so when we moved back um, uh, from Sweden, um, I, I uh, then began to get more active in, in uh, Rotary in, uh, in Oberlin. It was fun participating in some local projects and what have you, but I didn't get started on 100% attendance until uh, 1978. But it really was a very uh, important kind of um, opportunity because I was meeting all sorts of business folks and professionals uh, who are not necessarily associated with the college. And so it was a good way to, like um, my predecessor had told me to um, bring people together and, and work uh, well across the lines. And uh, uh, I think I was the last librarian at Oberlin who was in charge of both libraries. Later on, they 
public library uh, separated from the college. Um, they, they had always had their own um, board of directors, uh, but they set up a new building um, uh, elsewhere. And um, so it was when we were in Oberlin that we um, started our uh, idea of, of talking with and seeing uh, students, international students. Um, and um, so we have a picture here of um, one of our first uh, Rotary students. When we uh, when I finished at Oberlin, um, I had the opportunity to go to uh, to, to look at uh, to go to Emory in Atlanta, and I accepted that position as library director at Emory University. Um, and uh, so um, when I got to um, Georgia discovered that the um, there was a rotor club that met one block from my house, two blocks from where I was working. And so I immediately joined that club. By this time I'm working on 100% attendance. So I just kept going with it. And I learned that Georgia has this program called GRSP, Georgia Rotary Student Program. It had been going since 1947 uh, after the first uh, Second World War when um, a Rotarian had gotten the idea of bringing in students from abroad uh, to go to university in Georgia. And the first class was four students. By the time we moved there, they were bringing in about a hundred students a year. They were hosted by anywhere from one to two Rotary clubs all over the state of Georgia and going to universities and colleges, most of them undergraduates. Um, it was really an intriguing program. And before long, my wife and I got involved in helping to host some of those students. Um, the student that our club had was at a school that was close near, uh, close to the club meeting. And so we were able to get that student to join the Rotary Club and come to almost all meetings through the year. So uh, we really got, uh, the club members really got acquainted with the students and the students' families uh, later on when, when we were able to travel there. Uh, to see them. Um, but the program was uh, intriguing and eventually my wife and I became co-hosts uh, of the actual students where you, you maybe had the opportunity or the, or the need to take them in over holidays or Christmas holidays when they couldn't fly home um, and eventually became uh, hosts. And so I now have about 15 uh, Jerris P um, sons and daughters all over the world. The picture you see here is my daughter uh, on one side and Thuy from Vietnam uh, and my granddaughter, Rachel. Thuy was our first um, student that my wife and I hosted. Uh, she was so successful. You go back to Thuy there if you can for a second. But she was so successful at her school that they decided to give her a full scholarship for four years. And so she stayed with us for four years. The Rotor program ended after the first year and then it was our responsibility. She lived with us when she wasn't at the dorms. Um, the next year, you can flip the slide. Um, we got a boy from uh, Sri Lanka, um, Udara Soisa, uh, up there on, on the right of the picture. Uh, and um, Udi as well was so um, successful and, and, and um, involved with all kinds of activities and, and things that the school wanted him to stay. And so um, they did not give him, they gave him a half scholarship, but he had a well, uh, he had a Canadian um, relative who was a doctor and he filled up the other, the, the other part of the scholarship and he actually stayed for four years. So we had Twee for four, we had Udi for four there um, and they're like uh, brother and sister. This is a photograph later on when I was back in Sri Lanka on one of my first trips over there. Um, and uh, Udi and his buddies here um, were uh, taking us all up to uh, the tea country on the train. And we ran into these um, Danish girls uh, on, on, the, on the train. And so I convinced them to uh, join us uh, in the mountains for a couple of days uh, as well. Um, and so Twee and Udi are, are two of the very special students and I've visited both families uh, now several times. Um, Udi ended up uh, becoming a lawyer in um, Sri Lanka 
He now has his own uh, law school. Uh, he got his degree from London and another degree from Sri Lanka. And he has been operating until two years ago, COVID set it, shut it down. He's been operating a, a school for inner city kids in uh, up, upstate New York uh, that he got involved with as a uh, student counselor in the summertime and, and ended up running the, the program. So these are some other shots in, in uh, my visits to um, Sri Lanka. Um, one, one of, when I was, the, after my wife died in um, 2013, uh, Udi wanted me to come immediately over to Sri Lanka to uh, teach English. And uh, I said, no way, but a year later he got me there. And one of my co-teachers is this guy in the red shirt on the left or the one I'm handing um, the uh, Indian peace symbol to on the right, Mangela. So I've become very close friends of Mangela who now lives up in the tea country. And when we've done our Rotary Exchange programs um, with Sri Lanka, uh, we take each, our teams to his uh, city and to, um, he's now teaching English to village kids as a second, English as a second language up in the mountain areas. Um, and so these are a couple of photos with them. Um, this again is, is um, Thuy in Vietnam with her little boy, uh, Ming. Uh, and um, one of the things they, they all do in, uh, Sri La in Vietnam is to ride on these motorbikes. It's the mo most common uh, vehicle over there. Um, and they never go out on those bikes unless they're masked. They've been doing it for years and years and years. And Thuy has said that's why uh, Vietnam uh, has, has uh, avoided very much um, involvement with the COVID. They also shut down their borders with China. Um, and <clears throat> she said, if I were to come over there, I would be a lot, a lot safer than if I stayed here. Which <clears throat> would be fun to do, but not possible. Um, a couple of years ago, Udi finally got married. This woman had been trying to get him to marry her for years, my understanding was. Uh, and uh, I was able to be over there for the wedding around Christmas time uh, two years ago. Um, and uh, so I had, uh, they even had me, uh, they considered me as an extra father and the parents have to do something special, handing them some kind of gift, which I knew nothing about, but I was being coached by a couple of people um, as to how to, to, to do that. Um, but it was really fun to be there for the wedding. Um, I've not been able to get back there, so I really got not gotten to, to know his wife very well, and I'm hoping that uh, once we get through COVID, it will be possible to go there. Um, so there is um, uh, Udi and his wife, and these are uh, some of the other, uh, and, that, and that's his wife's sister, I think, on the one side. And then a couple of our, um, the guys that I, that had taught English with uh, on the, on the other side when I was over there in that school. So I'm, I've got a number of good friends. I've stayed with several, several of them when I've been over there uh, as well. Um, so let me um, go on a little bit more about uh, my rotary. Well, this, this is a, a picture in Sweden. I'm sorry, in, in Georgia. Uh, uh, the first time we met the uh, royal family and it was during the um, 350th anniversary of the Swedes uh, landing in uh, the United States uh, and setting up a colony on the East Coast and then uh, closing the colony and leaving. Um, but it was a big celebrations in Atlanta. I had, when I um, moved to Atlanta, I got involved in a lot of different organizations, um, including one called the Scandinavian American Foundation of Georgia. Um, I was singing in the, in the chorus there um, uh, as well. Um, and uh, the, and uh, got involved in a group study exchange uh, and became um, uh, the district group study exchange leader. This is uh, my a visit to Vietnam again when I went to see uh, Thuy. Uh, she sent me down to Ho Chi Minh City. The woman on my right is a California Rotarian uh, who has lived in and worked in um, Vietnam most of her career, uh, but she 
started the, did the first group study exchange between Vietnam, which has no rotary, and the United States. Um, and I had learned about it by, from the Rotary uh, Magazine and contacted her a couple of years later and said, I would like to do a group study exchange with your help from Vietnam to Georgia. Uh, it took some convincing to try to get her to do it, but that's her Georgia team. Um, hey Ted, can I pause for just a minute? Um, we're kind of at time here, so maybe. Oh, I am. Yeah, maybe what I could do is adjourn the meeting and he, hear who's up next. Yep. And then uh, those of us that can stay will stay on, and I can be here, Kathy, if you need to leave too. So. Okay. Ted, thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize time. No, that's all right. Do you want to let us know what's what to expect next week? So next week is a follow up to the club visioning session and we're going to have our uh, kind of the next steps outlining a little bit of what we're calling the streams of service. And it's just going to kind of be uh, myself and Jan talking a little bit about kind of what's next, what the plan is and um, how we're going to ask for help from a lot of different club members. So look forward to your engagement that way. Thank you. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. So we'll go ahead and call this meeting adjourned. And for any of you who can stay, I'd love to keep hearing what Ted has to say. And um, thank you much. Ted, do you want to continue? Um, sure. One of the things I was going to talk a little bit about, it, which I didn't, um, um, but, but this is that G GSE uh, team. And then I've got a number of pictures from projects that I worked on because when we moved, uh, retired in 2011 from my various careers, I was in library work until late 88 when I, I retired early because my wife had MS. Uh, we were doing a lot of traveling with um, internationally and locally with my professional work. Uh, and um, it wasn't uh, possible to be leaving her nor taking her very much with her, with me. So I retired from that and switched into um, working with a, com uh, a couple of friends who sold um, um, scooters for uh, folks that couldn't walk. Uh, my wife had bought one uh, and was using it. And uh, so we worked with them for, uh, did selling and uh, service for about 10, 12 years. Uh, and then I switched into uh, financial services um, and um, not until, well, we knew we always wanted to move back to Minnesota, but not until about um, 2008 or so, we got wind that there was um, a nice two-bedroom two condo available for sale in the building I'm in now, uh, which we knew about from years ago because my father had been one of the early residents here. And so we bought the condo and then made our plans and moved back here at the tail end of 2000. Um, uh, 2011. And the first thing I did was join Roseville Rotary, of course, because uh, I had been making up with the club quite a bit when I was coming back to this area. And so I've got a number of pictures here. This was the, uh, I remember the team that was here from Timor-Leste in Australia, uh, in Brad's here. Um, uh, and it just reminds us of some of the projects that we've done, that you guys had done long before I got here, which was the reading room at uh, Roseville Library. Um, this is a couple of family pictures. Um, our 40th um, anniversary photos here. We did, uh, we were married for um, longer than that, but it was a nice uh, photo of the whole family. And uh, my wife and I uh, at a Rotary uh, event um, in Georgia. Uh, the Georgia Rotary has another really interesting program or, or plan for their district assemblies. Um, there used to be a, um, two districts in, in Georgia and um, one was in the north, one was in the south. Uh, the north, of course, was mainly the Atlanta area, and, but they would always do their district assembly not in Atlanta. They would do them on Jekyll Island on the, on the coast. And the district assemblies would last from um, Friday morning until Sunday noon. Um, and so all kinds of club members from all clubs would go, go there to Jekyll Island for the whole weekend. We would always go down 
from our clubs on Thursday afternoon and have a big um, uh, club dinner and, and party and then um, uh, I enjoy the uh, the time with uh, various kinds of meetings and, and uh, free times off uh, in the course of the weekend. It was really fascinating. And, um, and these are some pictures from the group study exchange. Um, there's Erica and I in Sri Lanka with some teachers. I'm a kid at, at one of the schools where they're teaching. Um, here's the uh, incoming team. Um, Brad's here meeting at the airport. Um, and these are the uh, Roseville teachers that I took the first time. And Mandela there as well. I did a Rotary Friendship Exchange to India. This was um, my, my host fam, host of dad is on the uh, third one from the left. Um, and one of the rotor actors uh, from Minnesota is with us in the Sari. Um, another host family over to the other picture. And then of course there's uh, our connections with uh, Uganda, which started with Rotary here and um, Angela who came and gave a talk to the club about uh, what was then American Refugee Committee, now a light. Um, and uh, got me intrigued in the thing. And I actually uh, <clears throat> began meeting some of the people um, at a light <clears throat> and uh, went to uh, Uganda with a group uh, about four years ago for the big gala they had uh, in Kampala for um, refugee youth, pe young people who had um, come up with project ideas to improve life in the, in the community. Um, and that's where I met, um, I don't have a picture of him, but we met um, Sam Awari, the support, uh, incoming Rotary International President who died before he was able to take over. Um, but we introduced the um, Nakavali, Road, Road, uh, Nakavali young people who were at the gala to some rotor actors that were at that same meeting. Uh, and uh, Sam turned uh, to one of his aides there and said, you gotta help us get a, a uh, club going here in um, Uganda in the refugee settlement. Um, and so I came, Angela and I came back from that and uh, convinced uh, the Rotary Club here to help support it. So we were one of the ch uh, two charter clubs that got that going. And these are some pictures from some of those earlier visits. Um, the, this is a picture of uh, Angela and I handing out um, Days for Girl kits, right, Deb? Yeah. Uh, uh, at the Nakavali Center, which um, we did a couple of times. We took a bunch of suitcases over for Deb. Um, and then a project where we were um, working with um, uh, Nakavali young people and so on planting trees uh, in the Nakavali uh, settlement. So a couple of rotor actors in here, some visitors from uh, a light or ARC at the, as well. I'm not sure what other pictures. And uh, oh yes, these are, you recognize, maybe some of you recognize the um, necklaces we're wearing, um, which are those Roseville Rotary necklaces made from leftover plastic shoes. The artist is Patrick uh, on, on my right. Um, and uh, on the left is the singer Barrios who set up a uh, uh, recording studio over there. And they're both, they both are singers. Um, but uh, Patrick is the one who uh, made those particular items. And he's now uh, into big time building from plastic bottles, building things of one sort or another. So you see a table and chair on the other side. Um, that he's built. Uh, he most recently uh, built a small boat, uh, which sent us pictures of uh, as well from, um, uh, from Nakavali. Uh, and then uh, it was a, an honor for me to be in Hamburg at the Rotary International Convention when we hosted uh, Paul, who was here, uh, who was there for, as a speaker, and Tarangi from, um, also from American Refugee Committee. Uh, who has been his advisor. Tarangi is a Sri Lankan citizen, uh, now lives in Minnesota and been working in finance at um, ARC and Alight ever, 
ever since. We, uh, at this event, we were at a, um, an African dinner um, during the Hamburg Convention. Uh, and that was when um, the Rotary International President surprised Paul uh, with the President's Medal. Uh, there, there he is with the RI President on the, on the right hand side. Uh, a medal that had never be, been given to anyone but uh, prominent international uh, politicians in the past. And then we have, um, uh, when we had a Rotary International uh, President visiting us in St. Paul with the Rotaractors um, from uh, the Twin Cities, um, which club is kind of uh, fallen apart, I think. We need to try to help build it up. Um, I've been active in a lot of different kinds of things, volunteering, uh, like I've said before, in the church. I've been volunteering in the Y. I'm on the Y board now. Um, uh, the um, North Suburban Senior Chorus Singers, the male chorus. I'm a docent guide and uh, board member at Swedish Institute. And I was, I've been teaching English as a second language until COVID disrupted it um, at um, Wellstone High School in Minneapolis. And this is a photograph of an event that the Swedish Institute put on uh, where uh, seniors like myself were showing stories of our history, family's history to uh, African or Hispanic students from Wellstone School who, who have been uh, taking English as a second language. Um, and they were uh, given tours and heard stories of immigrants, stories of Swedes in, at the Institute. Um, and then were fed uh, Scandinavian food, which was strange to them. Uh, and then we would go back to Wellstone a couple of weeks later. And they would show us on the computer where um, various places that they had lived originally and came from. And also uh, then provided us uh, either Hispanic uh, or Somali food uh, for us to eat as well. Um, there is a photo of a small group of us from the North Suburban Chorus um, on one side. On the other, um, dressed for Christmas at the Swedish Institute as a tour guide. Um, and this is uh, uh, at the Swedish Institute, uh, a fantastic new exhibit called Extraordinary opened up last uh, in um, January of 2000. Um, no, December 2019. Um, and it had all kinds of things like these uh, plastic balls to jump in and swim in and play around in. Um, this I was over there volunteering um, one Sunday and uh, we were just uh, trying these things out. And that's on, so that's a pre COVID um, of the ball pit. And on the other side is the post COVID picture of the same thing, which has still been up over there. It is, uh, this is the last week uh, that the exhibit was going to be up. And of course, it's been shut down again since November. So it'll be going away and a whole new one coming in soon. And then these are a couple more pictures of uh, group study exchange. Um, there's the group study exchange from Sri Lanka with two members of the team that had visited them. Um, when we had our uh, pizza party here at uh, Villa Park. And um, some of us um, meeting the team uh, coming in from Sri Lanka uh, two years ago. And there is my granddaughter, Rachel. Um, when I was down visiting her a couple of years ago uh, and we were at a shooting range, hence the, uh, and, hence the ear protections. Um, Rachel's now, uh, she's got about um, uh, a half a year left in college. Uh, she is also a, a professional singer and, uh, and teaching music too. Um, so I thank you for the um, opportunity to talk today. Um, starting out as, um, I guess my 46th year in Rotary this year, this month. What's your plan moving forward, Ted? What's my plan? What's your next adventure? My next adventure? Um, well, uh, my, um, they want me back in, uh, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka again. Um, uh, and maybe, maybe we need to do some more work back in, in Uganda. 
uh, Ani wants me to go with her to her solar project in um, Som Somalia once we get through COVID. Um, so those are a couple of things. And then I would like very much to um, work on some of the issues of um, diversity inclusion uh, with Rotary, especially uh, like your help <laughs> and your leadership. Uh, and, um, and also we're trying to work on that uh, very thing this, it, it, with the Swedish Institute, looking at issues of diversity and how we can help in the local community where the Institute is located. We got a meeting coming up again on this, uh, planning on that this week. Um, um, Ani, uh, Ani has started her own uh, uh, NGO. I think it's your encouragement and urging. So I'm looking forward to working on that. Um, so all, all of those kind of things. Can't wait for vaccinations so we can travel again. Get back to volunteering where we see people. Get back to uh, in-person meetings at Rotary. <laughs> uh, all, all of those kinds of things. Yeah. Very cool. I, I personally really appreciate you. Um, I like your guidance. I like uh, your advice. Um, you've been uh, a, a very important person to me. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to tell you. I'm delighted that you joined. Um, 